What's up guys? I hope you're doing good. My name is Jesse and today I'm going to cover a classification of remote sensing data. So, why should we classify an image? If you want to make sense of our landscape, if you want to know where the forest is, where the water is, where the town is, if you want to know where the roads are, if you want to know where the schools are, if you want to know where everything you want to know is, you, ha you first have to classify the image. And then after classifying the image, you can be able to classify the areas. You can be able to know the vegetation is this percentage, it is this in acres, the water is this in acres. You can be able to know the build up is this in acres. And then you can do that over a given period of time and then be able to identify and quantify the changes that have occurred over a given period of time. And then from that, you can predict what will happen in the future basing on what you have studied in the what? In the past i hope that is fine yeah so before you do any classification the first thing you should always look at is the classification scheme a classification scheme refers to a set of rules that guide how we group our objects so using a classification scheme you'll know what to include under which class and then what to exclude under which class so here is an example of a classification scheme this is the Anderson classification scheme. So under the Anderson classification scheme, we have level one and then level two. Where level one is the urban, and then if you are to further subdivide and classify the urban, you can have residential, commercial, and industrial, but that is under level two. So if you're only looking at classification within level one, you're expected to have urban, agriculture, rangeland, forest land, water, wetland, barren land, tundra, and snow. But then if you go on to dig deeper into level two, then you can start to group the, 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 the urban area into residential or commercial, industrial or mixed urban, and then etc, etc, etc. What does this mean? Before you do any classification remote sensing, you should already set up a classification scheme. This will help you to know which classes you are going to deal with and then how are you going to name them. I hope that is fine. This is an example of a classified image. This is a Landsat 8 RGB image, and then this is a classification. So based on our classification scheme, we are interested in four classes. That was the built up, the water, the open water, the wetland, and then the vegetation. And then as you can see from here, we managed to, to classify this image into those four classes because that, that was our classification scheme. Yeah, I hope that is fine. So, Land use and land cover. Many times people confuse land cover with land use. When we speak about land use, okay, let me start with land cover. Land cover refers to what is on the, on the ground or on the land. So for example, if you have a given piece of land and there is grass, grass is land cover. You have trees, trees is land cover. But then when we speak about land use, land use refers to what is used on the land. So what is done on that land? For example, land cover is grass, but what is that grass used for? It can be pasture, or it can be used for recreation. I hope that is fine. Oh, if it is a built up, that is land cover. What is it used for? Is it residential? Is it commercial? Then that is land use. I hope that is fine. So the basis for image classification. So remember that different objects have different what? Radiometric properties. So if you are to take a particular object and then analyze its what its spectral curve, you may see that in a given band, a given object will be behaving in a particular way. For example, as you may look at this, this is vegetation and this is soil. Around band four, vegetation has a high reflectance than the soil. And then around band seven, the soil has a high reflectance than what? Than the vegetation. So I hope you see that. So, basing on a given image, it will have distinct spectral characteristics in a given region. So, considering that fact, we can be able to do what? To classify the images. But however, it is not as easy as it ought to be. Because within a given class, we may have spectral variability. For example, look at a forest. Although this is the spectra for, for vegetation, but different species of the vegetation will have what? Different spectra. So as you may look at this, we have vegetation 1, vegetation 2, 3, and then up to 7. And each vegetation has a given what? 
actually it is a different spectra so what do we do here we need to introduce feature spaces and then what are feature spaces feature spaces are just graphical representation of bands that are plotted one against the other as you can see this is band four which is here and this is band three and you see when we plot band four and then you plot the vegetation it will appear somewhere here because this is 40 in band 4 and then in band 3 vegetation is what vegetation is 5 you see and then when you plot it it will appear here and then you also plot the soil here and then as you can see using this we can be able to discriminate between the what the vegetation and the soil i hope that is fine so we move from a point to a region where the pixels of a given class of interest are occupying a given region as shown here and then which will enable us to further process our data for classification i hope that is fine what is the aim of classification the aim of classification is to delineate boundaries for those classes and then after delineating boundaries is to assign class names to each what to each delineated class when you do that you have achieved classification and then how do you do that you can consider two approaches one is supervised and then the other is unsupervised so with supervised learning i'm going to use this to demonstrate so consider this as our image and then you can see this is water this is a conifer and then this is another what another vegetation you select a, a given number of training pixels for each class you want to study here there are three and then after selecting these training pixels you feed them into the software and then the software will draw actually will use these pixels to determine the reflectance spectra for the training pixels and then it will use this reflectance spectra to classify your image actually what it does you input in the rules and then it uses the rules you've input into the software to do the classification i hope that is fine with supervised classification you give the software the rules and then the software gives you the output yeah later when we are covering unsupervised classification i would elaborate more i hope this is fine basing on what you have input into the software it will give you a land cover map as you can see here i hope that is fine so we have three commonly used supervised classifiers we have the pyro pipe the minimum distance to mean and then the maximum likelihood i'm going to cover each one of them one by one so how does the pyro pipe classifier work so for that classifier you should select a given number of training sets for a given number of classes for example three or five and then for each class the maximum and the minimum value will be determined in the x and y band remember we are considering not less than two bands for example band four and then band three so using these minimum and maximum values a four-sided pyrogram will be constructed and then let me sh demonstrate using this using this parallelogram pixels which fall between here will be classified to belong to this class and then these which fall between here will be classified to belong to this class however it is very simple and then few assumptions are made but however you can see that some of the pixels will be left outside yeah this is a disadvantage because when you look at this the image is, is what is a continuous space and then this approach creates discrete what discrete boundaries and then that means many of the pixels will be left what and classified and then that's why i introduced the minimum distance to mean classifier how this works you select a given number of pixels for the training classes and then for each class a mean is calculated and then a mean will be plotted as you see here if you have let us say two classes then you'll have two means and then from these two means the classification will be done pixels which will be near this mean will be grouped into this class and then pixels which will be near this mean will be grouped in what this class yeah 
I hope that is fine. One of the advantage it has is that all the pixels in an image will be what? Will be classified. Yeah. But however, it doesn't take into account what? This, the variability of the pixels in the image, as I have told you. This is because it is only considering the mean, the mean, the mean. So how do you overcome that? That is why we introduced the maximum likelihood classifier. Actually, actually, for remote sensing at a low level, maximum likelihood will achieve the best results you will ever want. I don't know whether we have ever used it, but from my experience, I have liked the results of the maximum likelihood what classifier. How does it work? Let me show you how it works. So first thing it does, it assumes that there is a multivariate normal distribution of the pixels in a given class. And then after that, so how do you use it? You should select a given number of what pixels for a given number of training classes. And then for those classes, the mean and then the variance of each training class is calculated. And then using that mean and variance, a discriminant function f of x is constructed as you see. This is the discriminant function where x is the subject pixel, then this is the mean and then this is the what? Yeah, the standard deviation or variance, whatever I may call it. So using this class, the probability of each pixel this x, the x pixel, to belong to a given what class is calculated. And then the pixel will be classified to belong to a given class in which it has the highest probability of occurrence. And then by so doing, the algorithm will take into account the variability of the what? Of the pixels in the data. I hope that is fine. And actually this statistical approach is one of the best classification techniques in remote sensing. I hope that is fine. Yeah. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to use this example. Here we have two signatures. We have mean signature two in the blue and then mean signature one in the green. And then this is our candidate pixel. By just looking, one may be tempted to think that this pixel in red belongs to the mean signature, this mean signature one. But however, when you take into account the concept of variability, which is represented by these lines. This is a yellow line, as you can see. And then this one is represented by the blue line. You see that this candidate kind of pixel belongs to this class, which is the main signature too. Yeah, so that is the advantage of maximum likelihood classifier over what? Minimum distance to mean or parapiped. For it, it takes into account the variability of the pixels in what? In an image. I hope this is fine advantage it has is that it achieves a good separation of the classes actually it's one of the best classifiers i've ever met but then to do that it requires a strong training set so it works on the principle of garbage in garbage out if you give it a poor training set of course expect vague results but however if your training set is very fine then you'll get the best out of the best i hope that is fine yeah so there are more and more techniques that are used for classification as I'll cover them later in our series. There are convolutional neural networks, there are support vector machines, there are decision trees, and there is also object-based image analysis or OBIA. So I'll cover them in the future, don't worry. Just know that there are more and more advanced techniques of what? Of classification. Yeah. So in the next video, I'll cover and survive what? Classification. Thank you for watching. I hope you've learned something. See you soon.